Hey, good day, everybody. Welcome to the Indian, yet another interesting interview with the Indian Boxer Ring. Um, now, today, my guest is Monique Hodkinson from South Africa. Um, Monique is a boxer breeder, breeding under the prefix Tanyadi Boxes, and she has bred um, about 24 South African breed champions, uh, out of which two of them are grand champions, a Hungarian um, junior champion, a uh, Brazilian champion, uh, a Peruvian youth champion. I think I need to have a drink after I uh, have for this introduction. Um, uh, several best in show specialty winners and a multiple uh, a reserve best in show winner, all breeds, and a multiple best in show puppy group. I'm going to go on, but you know, just for the benefit of time, I'm going to actually cut short that thing. I hope Monique, you're okay with that. Um, <laughs> That's fine. Uh, Monique is also a specialist breed judge and has judged specialties in South Africa and outside of South Africa, of course, which is her, um, which is where she's from. She's judged in England, uh, New Zealand, Australia, and Norway, and also the boxer breed at the All Breed Championship show in Ireland. Um, Monique is also qualified to award challenge certificates in all breeds, uh, in the working group. Um, now, from be, from being an ambassador for the breed, uh, Muni has presented seminars on the illustrated boxer standard, on breed type essentials, and the hallmarks of the boxer to qualified all breed judges, aspirant judges, and other interested parties in the Cape Town and Johannesburg. Uh, now, she's also written a lot of articles on various aspects of the boxer breed, and which have been published on her own site. So you can actually look up tanyadiboxes.com, uh, or you can just search for Tanyadi Boxes, you will see Monique's site. Uh, now, her articles have also been published on other websites around the world, and in a number of international boxer magazines as well. So, um, it, it's with great pleasure that I invite Monique to the Indian Boxer Ring, the breed Boxer Breed Education Forum. Monique, how are you doing this morning? I'm all good, thank you. It's uh, four o'clock in the afternoon here in South Africa. Um, and just, uh, I'm, I just wanna say the uh, website address for my boxer website is tanyatiboxes.co.za. Um, it's not a .com, it's hosted within South Africa. Um, but it's a great pleasure for me to be here. I'm quite honoured that you have invited me to speak to everyone, and um, I hope they will enjoy it as much as I know I will. Absolutely. Looking forward to it, Monique. Uh, and uh, for the viewers that are tuning in, and uh, for those that would actually be tuning in later, uh, this is going to be a two-part uh, interview. Uh, so it's going to be the interview is going to come at, at, at a later part, but Monique has actually graciously agreed to share uh, the brief presentation of the seminar that she actually uh, had conducted for the Box of Breed Judges. Uh, and uh, she's going to share that presentation at the, the initial part. So for those viewers that are actually tuning in, you know, please uh, pick up your notepad and pen. And if you have any questions, please make a note uh, of those questions on the comment section. And when, it, when I come back and ask Monique, I will actually make sure that I ask Monique those questions. Uh, so, Monique, I'm going to actually um, add the presentation on the screen, and whenever you can, whenever you're ready, you can actually take it on. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Isha. I hope I get this right. Okay. Are you seeing the presentation properly, Isha? Yes, I am. Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, um, this is a presentation that I gave initially in 2018. Um, I've updated it a bit to, um, so that I can present it today with some small minor changes. Um, it's um, Initially, I created it obviously for a South African audience, um, and now that I'm not just speaking to people in South Africa, it just needed a little bit of tweaking, so I'm hopeful that uh, it will be relevant to you. Just as a preface on what I'm going to present is uh, we're not going to rehash the boxer standard word for word. 
Um, I'm sure that all of us can read and I wouldn't want to waste time by going over every single word of the box of standard. The seminar is designed to give you a good understanding of the hallmarks of the boxer. Um, as judges, whether you are a boxer specialist or an all breeds judge that's judging the boxer, there are certain hallmarks that make the breed what it is and differentiates it to all other breeds. So it's important to know what those hallmarks are and so that you can look for them and make sure that they are there. I've made some assumptions uh, in putting this together. The five standards for the boxer are intrinsically the same. They, it does describe, describe the same dog, sometimes using different words. Um, so what I have done is I, I've included words and phrases from all five, not necessarily all at the same time, um, but I've, I've kind of chopped and changed between the various standards because of wanting to make this more inclusive. In South Africa, we use the FCI standard. So a lot of this is based on the FCI standard, but I'm, I have included other um, bits from the other standards as well. Another assumption I have made is that you've read the boxer standard at least once, that you have excellent knowledge of canine structure, that you have good understanding of general dog terms, and obviously there is no perfect boxer. So what I have done is I've used photographs of dogs that in my opinion best illustrate various aspects of the boxer standard that I am talking about. It is possible that there, I may present a picture of a boxer highlighting a specific thing and that boxer because it is not perfect may not be absolutely perfect in another part of the standard. So but that's why I say I'm, I'm using the dogs um, specifically for a, a portion of the standard that I'll be talking about. So what makes a dog a boxer? We have the general appearance, proportions, which are really important in the boxer, temperament, not so easy to um, judge temperament in the ring, but there are certain things that are very obvious in the ring that are not typically boxer. So I'll touch a little bit on that. I'll go through the head. Obviously the bite is, is incredibly important in the boxer. Angulation, boxer's angulation differs from, for example, terrier angulation. I'll briefly go through movement. And at the end, I'll just mention um, a little bit about color and markings. Right, so if I go on to general appearance, one of the most important things about the boxer is that it is a medium-sized breed. Um, whether a judge likes a bigger dog or a smaller dog is irrelevant. Um, the boxer is a medium-sized breed. So as long as the exhibit in front of you falls within the minimum and maximum, um, it will be a medium-sized breed. It's a sturdy square build. Square is another very important uh, part that makes up a boxer. It has strongly developed muscles. So when you're viewing a boxer in the ring, you want to see its muscles. You want to see that it's a muscular dog. You don't want it to be overly developed in, in musculature, but it should be a, a, um, a muscular dog. And it should exhibit substance with elegance. That's a very important part of uh, judging a boxer as well, is you, have, you can't have one without the other. So if you have a dog that's full of substance with no elegance, you're going to end up with a cloddy dog or an overdone dog. If you have elegance without substance, you're going to get a, a very light boned dog, which would never be able to do the job that a boxer should be doing. Proportions are really important with the boxer. There are two very important uh, proportions that we look at. One is the length of body to the height of the withers. And another is the depth of chest is half the height at the withers. This is what makes the boxer a square dog. So in order to measure the length, we measure from the point of the shoulder 
to the point of the buttock or the ischiatic tuberosity. That will give you the length of the dog. To measure the height, you measure the height from the withers to the brisket, and the elbow and the brisket should be on the same level, to the ground. And that is where the one in one proportion comes in the depth of the chest and the length of the foreleg, whereby you have your depth of the chest, half the height at the withers. Another very important proportion, which is something that has deviated quite substantially over the years, is the proportion of the muzzle to the skull. The standard is very clear on where you should be measuring this, and it actually states that it's from the tip of the nose to the inner corner of the eye, and the inner corner of the eye to the occiput. It's not from the lips or the protrusion in front of the nose, to the eye, it's from the tip of the nose. What's happening is that there are many dogs in European countries that are becoming very short in foreface or very short in muzzle. And if you were to measure them from the tip of the nose to the corner of the eye and from the corner of the eye to the occiput, you would not get a one third to two thirds measurement. Moving on to temperament. Temperament in the boxer is of paramount importance, and it's something that not only judges, but breeders as well need to concentrate and ensure that there's no compromise in the temperament of the boxer. It is a fearless, self-confident and calm dog, and the image on the left is a bitch doing an aptitude test, where she's doing, she's standing her ground as that um, dummy, for want of a better word, is slowly being dragged towards her. So she's she's being put under more and more pressure and she needs to be fearless and self-confident and stand her ground. The dog on the right is obviously doing um, a bit of man work um, and in order to fly at somebody with a, an arm, in, in Schutzhund or whatever you want to call it, then that dog needs self-assured courage. Obviously, you can't judge either of these things in the ring, but you want to ensure that as a judge, when you are approaching a boxer, that it is self-confident, that it's quite happy that you're approaching, that it doesn't cower away, that it doesn't growl at you, um, it doesn't hide behind its owner, um, and obviously should never um, pull forward or lunge at you. At the same time, in movement, you don't want a boxer that will go around the ring virtually on its belly. Um, and those are things that must be severely penalised. Moving on to the head. There are natural folds in the cranial region when alert. The muzzle should be as broad and powerful as possible. It has a slightly arched skull. It's not flat or round. In other words, it's not a football skull and it's also the head should never look like a brick. There are folds running from the root of the nose in a downward direction. And the muzzle is powerfully developed in three dimensional volume, in width, in length and in depth. The boxer's head has convergent planes. Your Doberman has parallel planes, whereas your boxer has convergent planes. They have a distinct stop, and the tip of the nose should be higher than the root of the nose. Not hugely higher, but perceptibly higher. Here we have a young dog, and you can see a very distinct stop, definite turn up of his nose. Again here, definite stop with the, you can see the tip of the nose is higher than the root of the nose. And again here. This is a very, very important part of the breed and, and should be another thing that both breeders and judges don't compromise on. And that is the size of the nostrils on a boxer. There is so much talk and so much thing, so many things shared on social media and on 
programs and YouTube and what have you about brachycephalic dogs and the syndromes that go with a brachycephalic skull. With the boxer having a foreshortened muzzle, you need to make sure that you don't further compromise the dog by having extremely small or stenotic nares or nostrils, um, because that would then make the dog, it would be a, a, cause the dog great difficulty to breathe properly, especially in the heat, um, where they do need to be able to get air into their nasal passages to cool down and then into their lungs. If this is where I have actually quoted all five standards, all of them speak about wide nostrils. Um, the FCI says wide nostrils. Australian uh, standard is the nostrils should be broad. The UK Kennel Club, that they should have wide nostrils. Canadian Kennel Club, the nostrils broad. The American Kennel Club doesn't mention the nostrils, but they say the nose should be broad and black. Um, and I think it goes hand in hand that if the nose leather is broad, chances are that the nostrils are as well. There's an example there of two dogs that have very wide open nostrils and they certainly wouldn't have a problem breathing. We all know that the boxer head is a brachycephalic head. I put here a comparison between the brachycephalic skull of the boxer on the left and a brachycephalic skull of the bulldog on the right. And while they are both brachycephalic, there are massive differences between these two skulls. What we need to take care of is that we don't breed the boxer closer and closer to having bulldog structure in its head. So when you are starting to make your noses shorter and shorter and your skulls rounder and rounder and your chins more and more prominent, you are moving towards a bulldog and not a boxer. The bite. Right, so the standard says that the lower jaw is slightly curved upwards and that the boxer is undershot. The easiest way as a judge to have a look at this is from the front, even before you open the dog's mouth, from the front, if you look at the nasolabial line and where it sits in relation to the lower jaw or the chin, it gives you a really good idea before you've opened the mouth of what you are likely to see. For example, if you find that the nasolabial line is not central to the lower jaw, then there's the, the bite is more likely than not going to be out of alignment or awry. So the easiest way once you've opened the bite or opened the mouth to, to check this is the frenulum in the top jaw on the top lip should be in line with the middle two incisors on the lower jaw. If that is aligned, then the bite is aligned. There may be wryness or, or a canting of the lower jaw so that there's more than just that to check for. But if your frenulum passes through the middle of your, the gap between the two middle incisors, then at least you know your bite is uh, aligned. The distance between the upper incisor on the right-hand side and the lower canine on the right-hand side must be the same as the distance between the upper incisor on the left-hand side and the lower canine on the left-hand side. So here you've got a picture of that same bite from the previous slide, viewed from the right and viewed from the left, and those upper incisors are fitting quite neatly behind the lower canines. That structure is what will be, is, is what also determines how the lips rest on each other. So there's a definite relationship between the formulation of the bite and lip placement. Obviously, the padding of the muzzle comes into play as well. This is a photo showing that the edge of the upper lip rests on the edge of the lower lip. And this is the bitch whose bite has been illustrated in the previous two slides. What you will find if a dog has too much uh, of an upsweep of the jaw or is too undershot is the lower lip. You'll start seeing the shiny part of the lower lip protruding past the upper lip. And if there is an issue with 
the bite and that the dog is either not undershot or incredibly tight, for example, a reverse scissor bite. Very often the upper lip will hang over the lower lip. And often when that happens, the chin will disappear um, and you won't get that muzzle being viewed in the three dimensions. Right, angulation. So the standard asks for a long upper arm, making right angles to the shoulder blade. They should have a well-formed forechest. The pastern is almost perpendicular to the ground. It isn't perpendicular to the ground. And in fact, if you have a dog where there is no slope to the pastern, you're likely to have a boxer with a terrier front or an incredibly upright front or a very short upper arm. The croup is slightly sloping. The hock is well defined with an angle of approximately 140 degrees. And the rear pastern is short and inclined between 95 to 100 degrees to the ground so that the foot stands behind the hock and not in front of the hock. As soon as you get a dog that is standing well back, but its foot is in front of its hock, you're starting to look there at a sickle hock. Generally, that's also linked to um, very tall hocks and instability in movement. Sorry, there's some background noises here. My workers are busy moving past. The movement. It's, li it's a lively movement. It's full of strength and nobility. It is efficient and ground covering. And there's powerful drive from freely operating rear. If we go to the first bit, the lively movement, full of strength and nobility. Nobility again speaks to the elegance that was mentioned right at the beginning. You want a boxer to move around the ring effortless, effortlessly, efficiently, but with nobility. So you don't want a dog pounding as it goes around the ring. You don't want it to look like a heavy duty machine going around the ring. That's, that's not a boxer. At the same time, you don't want puny little steps as, you know, sort of a light little butterfly going around the ring. In order for the movement to be efficient and ground covering, you do have to have matching angles between the forequarter angulation and the hindquarter angulation. But it also needs to be correct angulation. You can get a dog who is slightly upright in forequarter angulation, slightly upright in rear angulation, and it would have what appears to be very good movement, rhythmical and good movement. However, it's not efficient and it's not ground covering because the strides that a dog with that angulation will take will be much shorter than the strides of a dog that is correctly angled with a well laid back shoulder blade, very good return of upper arm and the correct angulation in the rear between the croup, the upper thigh, and the lower thigh. One of the things that you should look for when you are judging a dog and looking at its movement is pay attention to the rear. What you want to see when the dog is at full extension is you want to see its hock almost completely straight, which is what's illustrated in this photograph here. You also want the, the both forelegs and hind legs to be slightly raised off the ground. You don't want to see high stepping in front and you don't want to see hocks that are being thrown or what's looking like a bicycle or loads of action going on at the rear. You also want to look for a series of V's with this bitch. You can see there's a V between her two front legs. There's a V between her left front leg and her left hind leg. And there is a V between her hind legs, her left and right hind leg. You want the distance between the fore stride and the hind stride to be the same. All of this shows you exceptional movement. And if you find a boxer that can move like this, chances are when that dog is static, everything will fit where it should be fitting. Moving on to color and markings. Boxes are either fawn or brindle, according to the standard. Their brindle stripes should contrast distinctly to the ground color. 
So you want to be able to see the brindle stripes, or rather you want to be able to see the fawn undercoat shining through. White markings should not be discarded. So now this is a very interesting thing. If you read the words of the standard, it really describes a plain boxer because the standard then goes on to mention that white markings shouldn't be discriminated against, um, they can be quite attractive, uh, and that sort of thing. So it's very important when you're judging a boxer that markings should become very low on your list of criteria. Obviously, if the markings are such that it throws your eye completely, let's say, for example, you're looking at the head and almost half the head is white, obviously that you would take that into consideration because that affects the true expression of the boxer. But when you have a lineup of, of boxes, the last thing you should be looking at is color and markings. As long as the dog is structurally sound, looks like a boxer, is either fawn or brindle, has everything there that you want, then you can start looking at how much of white the particular dog has. Uh, obviously, there is personal preference. Some people prefer flashy dogs. Uh, others, it doesn't matter. Others may prefer the fawn or solid or whatever you, you want to term a, a box of a very little white. But it's really important not to get hung up on the amount of color that a amount of sorry the amount of white that a dog is showing you in the ring. Also bearing in mind that if you know the genetics of coat color inheritance, a solid classic plain boxer is worth its weight in gold in a breeding program because a dog like that, no matter what it is bred to, will never produce a white puppy. Now there is a movement obviously in the world at the moment towards allowing white boxes, not only in the whelping box, but also in the breed ring. It's something that's not allowed everywhere, but it's certainly something that is becoming more commonplace and there's more and more people who are advocating for putting the white boxer on the same level as its fawn and brindle brothers and sisters. But a white, but the, but the solid boxer is in other in fact if you bred a solid boxer to a white you'd get an entire litter of flashy puppies which is something that very many people um, pray for having in their litters right that's kind of the end of where i am so just to reiterate what makes a dog a boxer so if we look at general appearance it's medium sized it's square there should be substance with elegance and it should have strongly developed muscles. The proportions, the depth of the chest is half the height at the withers. The length of the body equals the height at the withers and the nose bridge to skull is a proportion of one to two. Temperament should be fearless, self-confident and calm and the boxer should exhibit self-assured courage. In the head, we want a slightly arched skull that we don't want flat or round. We want folds from the root of the nose running in a downward direction. It gives that, that kind of gives a finishing to the boxer's head. You sometimes find dogs boxes that are incredibly dry in skull, so they've got virtually no wrinkle, and that often comes with no wrinkle on the muzzle as well. And that then takes you away from your typical boxer head. The muzzle should be powerfully developed in three-dimensional volume. There should be natural folds in the cranial region when alert. It's also something that needs a bit of attention paid to. The folds should really be there when the dog is alert and when the dog is very relaxed, you don't want to still be able to see a whole lot of wrinkles on the top of the head. The muzzle should be as broad and powerful as possible. The boxer has a distinct stop and the tip of the nose should be higher than the root of the nose. Its bite, the lower jaw should be slightly curved upwards. It's undershot and the edge of the upper lip rests on the edge of the lower lip. Just going into the back to this lower jaw slightly curved upwards. That's what gives you the shape of the chin. 
Um, one of the other things that you can look at as a judge when you're opening a box's mouth is if the mouth is closed, you want the top teeth to be almost hidden by the bottom teeth. In other words, you don't want to really be able to see the top teeth. You want that behind the lower teeth so that you know that there is some slight curvature upwards of the lower jaw. Angulation, we want a long upper arm making a right angle to the shoulder blade. That is um, a visual measurement. If we were to actually look at the skeleton of the box, so that's not, it doesn't make a right angle. But once you've got your muscles and the skin and all of that on the skeleton of the dog, the visual impact that you see is that there, it, it should look like there is a right angle between the upper arm and the shoulder blade. You want a well-formed forechest. You want the piston almost perpendicular to the ground. You want a slightly sloping croup. You want a well-defined hock. This also is something that I have noticed um, with dogs that tend to lack angulation in the rear. Their hock joints are really quite weak. And often you can stand behind a boxer that has a rather small hock. And if you push that hock from behind the dog, towards the front of the dog, you can make that hock joint virtually straight, which, which you don't want. That, that is a weak hock. Your rear passing should be short and incline 95 to 100 degrees to the ground. With movement, should be efficient in ground covering, lively, full of strength and nobility. You want powerful drive from a freely operating rear. Your color and markings. The box is either fawn or brindle. The white marking should not be discarded and the brindle stripes should contrast distinctly to ground color. I think if I gave this presentation in a few years time, I think that particular fawn or brindle clause that I've got there would include white. I think that's the way um, that things are tending to go. So that's my presentation. I have been very lucky in that a number of boxer breeders and handlers around the world have given me permission. My previous um, presentations and in this presentation, I've added some dogs I didn't choose before and I've been given permission by those people to do that. And without the permission of these people, I obviously would have given a rather boring presentation and maybe it would have had to um, consist of drawings, um, which are never the same as the real thing. So um, I hope you will join me in thanking these people for allowing us to have a look at their beautiful dogs. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Monique. Uh, <clears throat> that was actually, uh, that was a much needed primer on a Sunday morning, at least for me. And for those viewers that are watching at different times of the day, I think uh, that was that was a really excellent, uh, you know, thanks for sharing your perspectives about the breed on and both in, you know, both in the eyes of a breeder that you are, as well as a judge that you are as well. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I, I know that uh, <clears throat> I know you I know that you the point that you are at right now uh, did not happen uh, overnight. Uh, there was a journey uh, which started. And, uh, and you are at a point where you understand the breed in uh, you know, through the perspectives that you share. Uh, so I want, for the benefit of those viewers that are watching in, you know, you, you are not only an ambassador for the breed, but you're also someone that people who are starting out with the breed would want to emulate as well. So I want to actually ask you a little bit more questions to share uh, and to get your perspectives about different aspects of the breed, the issues facing the breed, and also the breed in, in its evolution, how do you look at it? So the questions that I've put together are basically about um, to get your views, additional views about about the breed in general. But before I get into any of that, uh, what I wanted to actually ask you is I was actually looking at your website, Tanyadi Boxes, and um, I actually, <clears throat> I was looking at the page where you say about us, and there was an interesting mention about how you got into boxes. And would you be kind enough to share with our viewers on how did 
how you got your start with dogs and boxes, and how did you construct your initial learning curve with box with with dogs and and with boxes to have got into a space where you are at right now? Okay. <laughs> So the reason that I went into boxes is, is totally unintentional um, and, and quite amusing. Um, my husband and I um, bought a property that allowed us to have dogs. Um, as a child, I always had a dog. I, um, my first dog was a German Shepherd, which was given to me by my parents when I was 13 years old. Um, and subsequent to that I had another German Shepherd and another German Shepherd and um, when we got married and we bought a small holding I got incredibly excited because now I could get more dogs my parents had kind of restricted me to like one at a time um, but now I was going to be able to add so I was looking around at which breeds I liked and I looked at loads of photos and my husband liked Alaskan Malamutes and we liked uh, Siberian Huskies and there was an advert on television, which was for Radioactive, which was basically promoting radio. And in this video, there was a man who was preparing his dog's dinner um, and listening to the radio. And there was a funky song on the radio and he was dancing away while he was trying to get this dog's dinner ready. And this poor dog was sitting there waiting while his owner danced around the kitchen. And the advert then went on at some point where the owner was having a, a rest in the garden on a, on a lazy chair. And the next thing you see is the boxer has taken the radio, dug a deep hole and is burying the radio in the garden. Um, and I just thought that was brilliant. I saw, saw a boxer and I thought, oh, my word, I've, I just I have to get a boxer. So I started my uh, investigation of uh, the breed itself. I didn't want to just jump into it, so I did a bit of investigation. Um, we didn't have quite as much at our fingertips as we do these days with the internet, but I managed to find some information. And we then went and got our first boxer. I still had a list of all the other breeds that I wanted to add. But once we had got our first boxer, we were absolutely blown over. He was the most exceptional boy. Um, we, we, we just fell in love with him. He was a fantastic ambassador for the breed. And we, I just couldn't at that stage think of having another breed. So one boxer became two boxes, became five boxes. Um, and, and so I added um, until at the height I had 14 boxes. Um, learning curve i was very interested uh, i am interested in research I, I i use that for my job but it's something that's always interested me i want to learn more about things um, and so i needed to know more about the boxer and what better way than to join a judge's training program which is what i did and uh, started being shown photographs and listening to people in South Africa that had been in the breed for ages and were very willing to share their knowledge. But quite soon after this started, my husband and I both got a job overseas. And for various reasons, we decided to take that particular job. It was, a, it was an annual contract and off we went to the UK. And I then was at a position where I was no longer in South Africa where I could talk to people, but the internet was now available and I was able to look, um, I think it wasn't WhatsApp, but they, I can't remember actually it's going back quite a few years. Um, but they, I had a lot of conversations with uh, boxer breeders and judges in South Africa where I would find photos. I would send them the photos. I would critique what I thought I saw in the dog and they would either correct me or tell me that I, what I was seeing was correct. Um, while we were in the UK for that year, I, I traveled the length and breadth of the UK, um, attending boxer shows, uh, looking at all the dogs, um, chatting to breeders there. Um, I went across to Europe. I went to the Jahresieger, the German Jahresieger. I made contact with Karin Ryszewski, um, and she was fantastic. She also gave me so much knowledge. Um, Pat Withers of Witherford Boxes in the UK was somebody else that just an absolute wealth of knowledge. Um, and what I tended to do most weekends when I wasn't working 
I would hire a car and drive down, I was in Scotland, and drive down to Pat Withers in Shropshire and spend an entire weekend with her poring over pedigrees, photographs, looking at all her dogs. Um, and just I was just so hungry for more and more information. Um, I managed to get boxer magazines that I still have, I think, and I got them from somebody who'd had them for years. So, yeah, and, and those I've moved a number of times and I still have those magazines. So it was really a case of, of just me being really hungry and, and people that I was speaking to being willing to answer my umpteen questions because I, I'm the type of person you can't just say it's that. I need to know exactly why and where and when. Um, yeah, so that's where, where that all came from. Wonderful. Thank you. I, uh, again, um, I was going to actually ask you what was your second dog in that list of dogs that you had um, after the boxer? Which, was, which one was the second one? Alaskan Malamute. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Was was it the hair that was the decider? The short coat breed versus uh, you know a lot of hair. Was that the decider? Um, I I don't think so. No, I don't. I just we got one boxer and we were like, why okay. should we look anywhere else? Uh, you know, I mean, this was it. This is what we wanted. The the sense of humor. The mm. I did a lot of training with him. He was an amazing dog to do obedience with. Um, we did Schutzhund work with him. It was just. I didn't need to look anywhere else. So the, the list kind of fell away. Once we'd had him um, for not very long, the, the list fell away. And uh, yeah, and until four years ago, um, mm -hmm. boxes were the only three that I had. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to come back to this question again about a second breed, but that's not for now. We are here to talk about boxes. I'm going to stick with boxes. And again, people that are watching and are not going to like it if I spoke about Alistair Malamutes. Uh, but then, um, now I, I know that you mentioned, uh, or in my introduction, I mentioned that you bred uh, about 24 um, South African champions, and some of them have gone on and won in different countries. Um, I want to actually get straight to the point. I want to actually ask you this question. Boxer is not the most easiest of breeds uh, that, you know, it's not like, and again, I think it would be fair to compare a breed which is much easier to breed uh, without so many defects. Um, we're dealing with this, and again, the fact that people breed boxes and love boxes and keep breeding boxes or preserve boxes is because it's purely by, because of the love they have for the breed, um, mm. because it's not an easy breed to keep or breed. Uh, maybe a fun breed to keep, but not easy to breed. Uh, no. So what has been your biggest obstacle with breeding boxers? I think where I live, actually, um, South Africa is at the very tip of Africa. We are far from anywhere. Um, and I think initially before we had the internet and Facebook and uh, it's now become incredibly easy to to chat to people. You can video call them. Um, but in those days, everything really was almost done by letter. Um, and being so far away, um, I don't think that South Africa was a destination that a lot of breeders would be interested in sending a puppy. Um, so I think the distance was a huge thing. Um, also, when I started, we were very newly married. Um, we didn't have a lot of money. So at sort of in the beginning, until we managed to work in the UK, um, we were very restricted with finances as to what we could do. Um, artificial semen was not really available in South Africa at that time. Um, and I certainly, you know, didn't have a, this, the kind of budget that would allow me to import anything. So I think it was more location and finances, really, um, that that made it difficult. Mm. Um, I, I know that you mentioned this, um, and I actually, when I was preparing for this interview, researching on your website, I saw that you have, over the years, imported a lot of dogs uh, from other countries. Maybe when I say a lot, it's very, uh, it might not be a lot, uh, compared to, uh, but you have infused breeding, uh, mm. you know, bloodlines from different countries onto your breeding stock. Uh, 
So in yeah. this process, and my question next to you is going to be about uh, outcrossing, right? Because you're actually outcrossing when you are infusing bloodlines into your breeding stock. Um, how do you, you know, there is actually a, a notion that outcrossing is um, is actually sometimes it, it's like a it's like a crap shoot. You know, you either get it or you might get nothing out of it. You might get something a flyer or you might get a, a litter of pet quality puppies. Um, right. So my question next is: Would you equate would you equate outcrossing to the luck of the draw? Um, it depends. If you have researched the pedigree of the dog that you want to introduce as an outcross um, and you know what stands behind there and what I have done when I've imported dogs is I've made sure that I don't import a dog that is an outcross itself because if you outcross to an outcross I think that tends to be where you can fall a bit foul of not really knowing what's going to happen and it's a case of anything goes but if you have a tightly bred line yourself and there is an outcross that is tightly bred and has the attributes that you want that complement your breeding or your bitch or whatever it is that you are um, um, wanting to breed, then I think it is, I wouldn't say that it's luck of the draw. I think it becomes more a calculated, I don't want to use the word risk, but it becomes, I will, it becomes more of a calculated risk, although in my mind, it's not a risk. So I think it all goes down to know what you are doing, know what stands behind your dogs and what your line is um, producing reliably and the line you're introducing, know what that line is producing um, reliably. And I think if you do that, you lessen your odds and oftentimes you can really produce something quite fantastic. I think the secret then is to take something from that combination and go back into line. I think if you continue to outcross and outcross and outcross, I think you, you, you're in danger of losing your way. Um, people talk about hybrid vigor which is a real thing. Um, if you start breeding too closely, um, there's loads of problems that, that you can uh, create. Um, but oftentimes that's also related to smaller litter sizes, maybe not as vital puppies that are born. Um, but still, but it's the same, whether you're outcrossing or you're line breeding or inbreeding, if that's, if that's what you do, um, it's you need to know what you're doing. You can't just sit there and say, oh, well, Bob's got a nice dog. I think I'll use Bob's dog. It's of no relation to mine. Well, you know, let's see what happens. And it's yeah, a boxer. You do that, it's luck of the draw. Yeah, exactly. Right. Then, right. yeah, it's the luck of the draw if you do that. There is a place for outcrossing. There really is. Mm, true. Again, my, and again, again, slightly off tangent here. So I, my, my good friend in Australia, Eileen, um, she actually uh, mentions this, you know, she says, uh, outcross, you keep outcrossing, you're going to get a fruit salad pedigree. And yeah. what's going to happen, what's going to happen with that is, uh, you know, it's going to be, you, you're not going to get what it's going to be. Every litter is going to be exciting because it's going to be a very surprising litter. You're not yeah. going to know what you're going to get. Right. So obviously yeah. as a breeder, you don't want to get, you know, take that route. Um, no. but having said that, you know, you mentioned a few things in your response here, um, about, you know, about breeding back, you know, line breeding. Um, I want to actually ask you this, as a breeder who's bred, um, who's bred some, who's bred some really nice dogs, um, what do you feel as a breeder when you breed a litter and when you have a, the litter arrives and, you know, it's on the ground, what do you feel constitutes a great show litter? Um, I think great show dogs are not born every day. So I think to look at an entire litter and say, well, I've hit the jackpot. This is going to be a full on show litter. I think that that's, it can be a bit naive. Um, I obviously there have been cases, uh, very famous cases in the past 
where that has happened and has worked and it's been amazing. But I think for the general breeder, um, and let's face it, there's very few breeders these days that have the kennels of dogs that um, breeders sort of 40, 50 years ago had uh, for various reasons, um, eco economics, um, housing sizes, uh, things like that. Uh, there's very few that can run massive kennels. So I think that if I breed a litter, and I've, I've, I've done my homework, so I think I know what I'm going to get, and I have a look at the litter, if there are a couple of puppies in that litter that I think, well, yeah, I think I've, I've got it here, then I'm very happy. If I have a litter of mediocre puppies and one stands out, I don't think that's a great litter because then the question is, your one super shining star, will it breed on? So I wouldn't want, an, I wouldn't want to say that an entire litter is, is um, you know, I can say that entire litter is, is show quality because I think if you say that, I think possibly mediocrity is, is what might happen. Um, but, and, and the opposite to that is if there is only one that is hugely more um, superior to the rest, that to me is also a bit of a red flag. Uh, for me, what I would like is a litter that I can look at and say, yeah, there's some, there's some good stuff in here. Um, those two puppies really look quite, quite sort of what I'm looking for. And, you know, those are the two that I'll concentrate on. That to me is a better show litter. Right. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, no, I actually want to actually, um, you know, I, I want to actually move on. You know, of course, I want to, I want to come back to the issues with breeding um, later. Um, when I talk about deviation, but what I what I want to actually ask you this is your um, you know your actually your role as a judge has actually opened the windows for you. Like you said, when you actually took that assignment to go to UK, uh, that was like an eye opener of sorts because you get mm -hmm. you got a chance to meet with those luminaries in the breed, uh, and you got a lot of knowledge. And you're a person who likes to research. Now. The opportunity for you to become a judge has also kind of, and being a person that you are that researches dogs, you actually look at evolution of boxes at least. You know, and again, I'm not going to age you here, uh, Monique. I'm not going to say you've been researching boxes for the last 60 years. No, I'm not going to say that. Uh, I don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to. That's going to be wrong. Uh, but in the years that you actually research dogs, you look at the evolution of boxes um, from the starting point. Uh, what are some of the things that have happened to the boxer breed uh, that have actually cost, uh, or that have actually cost for it to actually improve? And on the flip side, what has been some of the developments that have been to the breed's detriment? Like, for example, what are, what are some of the what are some of the things that we've achieved in the years in evolution, and what are the things that we've gone back? I think if you look at these uh, photos of boxes in the, these magazines that I mentioned right at the beginning, um, where you're looking at sort of boxes from 40 or so years ago, um, and you compare them, I wouldn't say to present, because there are some issues with the boxer at present, but what I have found as a, a good evolution of the breed is the um, development of the head so that I believe um, when I look at the sort of old photos compared to photos let's say from the 90s uh, or, the, or the 20s whatever um, I do see refinement of the heads uh, and refinement I don't mean um, making them less, I mean just developing the, the box ahead so that it starts looking like the words of the standard. Um, with angulation as well, um, if you look at some of the photos of the old boxes, there's, you know, they, they, you almost look at them and think, how did that really fit in with the words I'm reading in the standard? So, I think also, obviously, in the beginning, there was a very small gene pool. And while the Boxer is a highly inbred breed the world over, there's, there's not a huge amount of genetic diversity. Um, 
in the beginning, obviously, there were less and less people uh, than there are now. So I think as shows came about and, and uh, became more uh, frequent and people were able to share ideas and um, share bloodlines and things like that, obviously, it, the, the breed evolved, as has every single breed, because if you look at old photos of any breed, they very seldom look like the breed did now or 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so I think for me, the evolution has produced um, a boxer that I believe is is quite close to the, to the words of the standard. Um, on the flip side, the biggest detriment, um, I think that while there is quite a bit of sharing, there's also some very uh, closed views where you have uh, breeders or regions or countries that will not look outside of their own um, pedigree base, uh, um, whatever. Um, and so they're basically going round and round with the same stuff. And when that happens, if you are not open-minded to look elsewhere, you basically breed yourself into a corner where you now look at what you've got and you think, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. I, I, there's, there's nothing because we've been all traveling down the same slope um, and, you know, there's nowhere to go. So I think the detriment to the breed is people who are not open-minded um, in looking at other things. Um, it might not be a style that um, you're in love with or is your ideal, but having seen boxes uh, all over the place, I can say that the best boxes in each of the styles are almost as good as each other, um, and there's not huge differences between them. So I think as long as, uh, as people are open-minded and not set in their ways, um, I think that's what is needed in order to, to make sure that, you know, we don't get ourselves down the plug hole. Wonderful. Very, very well. Very well said. Thank you so much for that. Uh, now, in terms of, uh, I want to actually look at, and, uh, and not so much in terms of deviation, but in terms of, uh, in terms of styles. Um, right. It's one type, but different styles, right? We still have, we don't have, um, you know, we, we don't have like a, like an American um, boxer or a German boxer, even though we call it in terms of style to differentiate the styles, we call them as a UK style boxer or a American mm -hmm. style boxer or a European style mm -hmm. boxer. Right. In terms of your, in terms of the evolution of um, these different styles, my question is twofold. One is, what is your take on the evolution of boxes in these three uh, regions that I mentioned, UK, USA, and Europe? And what are the some of what are some of the attributes that you like in these styles? Because I believe you actually imported a dog from US, and um, you've gotten a dog from Europe as well. So, and UK of course as well. So you've gotten all these three styles in infuse them in your breeding program. So what do you see first of all in the evolution, and what are some of the attributes you see in them? Um, I think that. One of the most obvious differences, and I'm not talking about the, the style of the boxer itself, I'm talking about the show scene, um, is very different in within those three styles. So um, your professional handlers in the States, um, I think handling in the States is on a whole different level um, to certainly handling in, in South Africa. Um, but also, if you compare the way that a dog show is run in, in Europe, uh, let's say Atibox, um, compare that to Westminster, um, and, and it's, I wouldn't say compare to Crufts, because in Crufts, um, dogs from all over the world uh, can and do participate. But in general, within the boxes, 
I don't think there's there's too much uh, other than the the sort of UK boxes that are are shown at Crufts and and most of the the boxer shows in the UK. So there's a lot of emphasis on different things, and I think the emphasis on different things and and let's face it, we we all come from different parts of the world where life is different and priorities are different and outlooks are different. And it ripples through to everything, um, including our dogs and what we see and what we like. Um, and I think that I think that has played a fair role in in how the breeds have developed those three styles. Um, as I also mentioned previously, when when people are closed to other styles, then your divergence becomes even more um, because you you are going in a direction that somebody else wouldn't even dream of going in, and then you just become almost polar opposites. Um, but again, I go back to what I said earlier that if you take top winning dogs from the states from Europe, from uh, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, they're actually not that that different. Yes, there, there are certainly some uh, style differences, but I think it's important to, to realize that the good ones are pretty much on a par, and it's very easy for people to look for the huge differences. So instead of looking perhaps at the upper levels, you're looking sort of lower down, then then you are going to see huge uh, differences because, you know, it's you're playing on a different playing field. Um, you know, it's it's like playing, I don't know, this club soccer and soccer for your country. You know, it, it, it's it, it's kind of a World Cup is a bit different to a little, you know, local football match or, or whatever. Um, so I think that's that's a lot to do with it. There's there's way more, um, but I think I think to me, obviously, this is my opinion. Um, it's it's there's there's various factors: the way the dogs are shown, the way they are kept, the way uh, shows are run. Um, you know, the 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 um, acceptance of of other bloodlines, things like that, that all comes together um, to to contribute to, to differences. Right. Um, the attributes I like in the styles, uh, there's, there's something to like in everything. Um, and as you mentioned, I've imported um, from the States, from the UK, um, from Europe. Um, my, the dogs I started with, um, also had European bloodlines in them, American bloodlines in them. So uh, I was very lucky in that when I started, I had, uh, I don't want to say universal, but, but pretty close. Um, and my aim has always been to try and bring the best of all the styles to, to my, my breeding and what I'm I see as the ideal boxer. So what I love in the American or the North American dogs is um, I love their attitudes, um, their coats, their, um, their their elegant necks, um, you, you, their, their cleanness. They, they, they generally aren't overdone in skull. Um, from the UK, uh, I, I I really, I really like UK dogs. Um, I love their balance. Um, in general, they've got really good rears that are strong. Um, temperaments are amazing. I've seen really amazing temperaments judging in, in the UK. Um, in Europe, pigmentation is, is a huge plus. They, they've really got that really good. Um, I don't think you'll ever, I think it's not allowed, but even so, you would never find a boxer in an in a European country having had its mask blackened. It, number one, there's no reason for it because they're really well um, pigmented. Um, and two, I think the FCI rules, you just, you know, you, you're not supposed to. And then in fact, 
you shouldn't be you shouldn't be doing that regardless of which standard you follow, which ring you're showing in. Um, and also the the temperaments of uh, of European boxes. And and in saying this, I have to talk quite a few years back. I haven't been to Europe for a very long time to look at boxes. Um, but when I was there, the the really good working temperaments, the um, their um, just there, they're the real deal, really, um, as far as the, your, your courage, your, um, you know, your family protector, you know, that sort of thing. So there's something to like in, in all of them. There really is if you open your eyes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> now, you mentioned uh, something, and um, I'm going to actually, you mentioned something about pigmentation there. Uh, pigmentation about the graying off the you know the mask you know uh, the the rich pigmentation um, you know you don't need to do it right because the dogs don't age uh, or they don't actually gray they don't have gray hair uh, soon enough uh, I want to actually talk about I want to bring this to something you're very passionate about and I know that you are <clears throat> uh, you are actually involved with uh, raw diet uh, and I, I'm going to let you talk more about that. Uh, raw gold. Raw gold is something that's, that you're very passionate about. That's a company that you uh, that you are involved with, which actually is got to do with raw diet or barf diet, as they as they call it. Uh, now I know it's a very contentious topic. Uh, raw diet is, but I want to get your views as an owner. What have you found uh, that makes you consider to be a balanced diet? What do you consider to be a balanced diet for the dogs? A balanced diet, um, there's loads of components that go towards making a diet balanced. Um, there's often a preconception that raw feeding is raw meat and nothing else, and that is highly unbalanced. Um, so, you know, that you, you, you've got to make sure that um, the dog is getting enough uh, meat, enough animal fat, which they use for energy. Um, they need bone in their diet. Uh, there's vitamins, minerals, things like that, that they need in their diet uh, from the, the point of view of, of the meat or protein. Uh, as far as, as I believe, protein for a dog's diet should be an animal source and not uh, a plant source, which um, a lot of your kibbles um, tend to have plant proteins in, they do have some animal protein, but plant protein is quite a big ingredient. Um, so, so for me, it's, it's knowing um, all the, the, you need to know the elements of what makes up a balanced diet and you need to make sure that that is what you are giving your dog. So um, your, your, Calcium to phosphorus ratio, for example, you, you need to make sure that's right. Um, it's, it's you've asked quite a difficult question. Um, for me to I'm, just I'm, uh, if, if it's gonna if it's gonna be a separate discussion in itself, I'm gonna yeah. invite you to come back again and do it. But let me ask you something. Yeah. Let me ask you something simpler, um, at least simpler for me. Uh, I know you, you. I know you can talk for hours about this topic, which is very yeah. passionate for you. Uh, so my question to you is, um, I've, I've actually, you know, um, you know, I've, I've done a few, um, you know, I've read a few, a few articles, I've watched a few interviews about raw diet. It's a world of information. Uh, now, I also know that, you know, when I was reading about it, I also saw that domesticated dogs, right, the dogs that we keep at home, they are different from, uh, they're different from wild dogs, their distant cousins, uh, because of their genes that they possess um, for digesting starches, starch, for digesting starch, uh, which sets them apart from their carnivorous cousins. So my question to you is, do you feel or do you think that the digestive tracts of canines, domesticated can, can or canines, have evolved with domestication? There's definitely been some um, um, evolution. Um, 
to my mind, not enough to to move dogs from where they should be sitting as opportunistic carnivores into omnivores. Um, one of the things that does differ between uh, digestive tract or the, the, the mechanism of digestion with a wolf to a domesticated dog is that domestic dogs now do have amylase in their saliva, which is, is needed for, um, for digesting your, your starches and carbohydrates, which um, the, the wild dogs don't have. So there has definitely been some evolution. Um, however, there, if you were to look at the digestive tract itself, and uh, you, you would be hard pressed to be able to say if you have the digestive tract of, of a dog of a similar size to a wolf, and you have both of those on a table, it would be virtually impossible for you to say, well, that's the wolf and, and that's the dog. So their inner workings have not evolved to a rate that now moves them out of the continuum that they are in. Um, one of the things with dogs, which is why they became domesticated, is they are, um, they are able to um, adapt to whatever we, the owners, throw at them. So they're the master of adaption. So adaptation, sorry. So they have had to evolve in order to eat what they were being fed as soon as humans stopped being the hunters that they were and started settling. Um, and the, their diets changed. They started growing their own crops. So their, their sort of dogs or sort of pre-dogs um, had to uh, evolve with that. Otherwise, they would have starved. So, but I firmly believe that while a dog has had some ad adaptations and is able to survive on a non-species specific diet, they don't thrive like they would if they were being fed what they have for centuries been designed to eat. So, so that's, that's the thing. Visually, you won't be able to see um, much, if anything. Um, and yes, they they are adaptable, but there's a there's quite a big difference uh, to coat condition and musculature and teeth and things like that when a dog is is fed a species appropriate diet. As with any as with any animal, you know, they everything eat, should be eating a species appropriate diet. True, very true, very true. Um, I want to actually move on to something um, something totally different. You know, we actually talked about um, breeding. We talked about, uh, you know, we talked about diet. I want to now move on to judging, you know, your, uh, you know, the, you know, something that has taken you to different countries, you know, given you the opportunity to judge different type or no, same type, but different styles of boxes. Uh, now you have a mental blueprint uh, as should any breeder have um, and uh, you're your blueprint is very defined, right? So, you, like for example, you know, you, it's so defined that you actually put a presentation together on how a boxer should look, or how what you you know you have very very set views about how the boxer should look. Does yeah. that put you that does it make you make it easy or difficult for you to judge the varying styles or different styles which deviate so much from your mental blueprint when you're traveling to judge a dog in a different country? So, my mental blueprint doesn't really have a set style. Um, as you will see in, in the presentation that I gave, I used European dogs, I used North American dogs, I used English dogs, New Zealand, et cetera, et cetera. If my blueprint was so set on a style, then because that presentation is my interpretation, they would have all been of a similar style. So for me, it's not difficult. For me, and as I said right at the beginning, the five standards are not that different. Um, and if you weed out the sort of surplus information or the, the let's say, the, the way that something is described, at the end of the day, they describe the same dog. So if I'm looking at a dog 
And when I look at it, its head is in balance to its body. Its, its nose to skull relationship is one to two. If its forequarter angulation is, you know, if it's got good layback of shoulder, good return of upper arm, uh, it's got a, a strong top line, uh, tail set is correct, um, all of that. It, it, the style is immaterial. Um, so I think where it could become difficult is if I'm faced with three completely different styles in the same class, then I think it does become a little more difficult. But that generally doesn't happen. You know, if you're judging in one region, generally, you know, the dogs are pretty similar um, in style. But I, I honestly think that if you, if you know the standard and you can objectively apply it to what's in front of you, style should not uh, be an issue. I, I, you know, as, I, as, as you've said and as I mentioned earlier, I imported from sort of the three different styles that there are. Um, I produced a dog that combined all of those and he was my top winner and he did a lot of winning and he did a lot of winning under uh, South African judges, but under judges from the UK, judges from um, North America, judges from South America, um, judges from Europe and, and all those judges could recognize him as being what they believed was good confirmation to the standard that they were judging against. So, yeah, I, I just, I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's difficult as long as you know what, what you're looking for in terms of the words of the standard. And again, you have to be open-minded. You can't, as a judge, you cannot go into a ring um, and say, well, the only dogs that should be here are this particular style and therefore I'm not even going to bother with the others. You can't do that. If you do that, then, then I don't know, you wouldn't get my entry. Um, you know, we, we've got a we've got a huge responsibility as judges to to be open minded and and not restrict uh, what we are awarding, really. Very true. Uh, my my next question again. Thanks for being. Uh, this is an excellent segue for my next question, which is about the responsibilities of judges. Um, you're a judge. You're a breeder. Um, so you wear both hats. Uh, now, who do you think is more responsible for the deviations in type? You know, there's a term called as a hypertype, right? Uh, more mm -hmm. is better, right? More is better. Mm -hmm. More of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, height, more of elegance is better. More of bones is better. More of head is better. I know you're shaking your head in disagreement, but I'm not, I'm not proposing that view. I'm just saying no, that no, this, is how, this is how it is perceived. Uh, but who would you attribute this more on? Would it be the judges or would it be the breeders? Who's more responsible? I think equally responsible. Um, if the breeders are not breeding to standard and putting those dogs in the ring, what are the judges going to be judging? And and the the flip of that is if the judge uh, doesn't, know really what they're doing I, I don't mean to be disrespectful but if they don't know the standard and know the trends of the breed around the world um, then no matter what the breeders are bringing in the correct dogs might not be being recognized so I honestly do think it's it's they share the responsibility um, I take judging extremely seriously. I, I, I'm not, I don't step into a ring to smile at friends or to greet friends or to put friends up. I, I tend never to look at the handler. I, I'm not interested in who's handling the dog. For me, my only loyalty is to the boxer breed itself. And I need to honestly put up what I believe is closest to what the standard is describing there will absolutely be people who will totally disagree with with my placements um, which is fine um, we all have different priorities uh, some may put 
uh, more emphasis on, on uh, heads, some might put more emphasis on um, rears, you know, it, it just depends what a, what a judge's um, sort of number one thing is. And, and the opposite of that is obviously what they would forgive. And what one judge will forgive, another may just, that might be that judge's priority. Um, so we share it. Um, we honestly do. And if the breeders are not putting in front of the judge good examples, um, the breed is going to move in a direction that it shouldn't. And if the judges are not honest and knowledgeable, then they will be rewarding the wrong dogs. And um, people are funny. Uh, people will um, sort of follow the trend. Uh, I don't mean your sort of older breeders or your your set or breeders that have been doing this for a long time. I specifically also think about the new breeders that come into, into the um, breed. Um, those new breeders, if they're serious, would be visiting other breeders, they'd be going to shows, they'd be standing ringside and looking at not only what's in the ring, but what the judge is awarding. And if the right dogs are not being rewarded, then the impression that those new breeders or, or to be breeders has is is in the wrong direction. Um, so yeah, it's it's I think it's a shared responsibility. Um, I don't think that a judge should set, step into a ring if they don't really know the standard well. And I don't think a breeder should be putting into the ring, not only the ring, but into their breeding program, something that is is not going to improve the breed. Right. Um, you know, again, uh, I actually am, I'm, I'm actually drawing this question from what you said, you know, the role of judges in uh, deciding the course of the breed. It's extremely important, you know, breed loyalty, you know, they should actually do what is right for the breed. Now, let's say, for example, and again, I'm not a judge. Uh, I hope to become one someday. Uh, but when actually you are judging a dog and you are actually judging some a breed that you don't have not kept or you've not actually kept this particular breed and you are judging it, uh, you're judging it. Are you judging it based on structure or are you in are you judging it based on type? Uh, what is, you know, I, I feel, or I, uh, let me say, I don't feel, let me, uh, there is a notion that the judges take a safe route or they resort to the route of convenience judging and judging on structure than on type. What are your thoughts about that? Type is everything. Um, that's what makes a breed a breed. So if you start judging for a generic dog, you are going to end up with the breeds kind of mishmashing together and, and you know you can almost get the mental picture of a judge standing there watching the different breeds come in and they just kind of morph one into the other into the other and uh, you can't sort of pin your finger on exactly what it is so type is 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 the most important thing i mean we have different breeds for a reason um, and type is what separates them. If you go on construction or movement only, you may end up with a dog that's well balanced and moves efficiently and looks great going around the ring, but it's not a boxer or it's not a German Shepherd. So it's vitally important that you breed for type. And when you find the most typey, then you start going into the nitty gritties and saying, right, now now I've got a, a typey animal. Now let me go and, and look at all the various parts and just check those against what this type of dog should look like, act like, move like, or whatever. Um, there's a, a, a quite a, a, a bad movement towards generic movement in, in dogs where you know, you read people's uh, critiques or comments on a particular breed and they, they talk about great reach and drive, but they're doing that to a breed that shouldn't be doing that. They shouldn't have reach and drive. Um, you know, so again, if, if you are stepping into a ring to judge a breed you don't have, you shouldn't be stepping into that ring unless you've spent a lot of time with breeders of that breed 
um, watching judges judge that breed and asking loads of questions because to my mind, I'm doing a hell of a disservice to a breed if I step into that ring and I actually don't know what I'm looking for because then, yes, I will put up or a judge will put up the, the one that looks the fanciest or move, seems to move the best or the, you know, whatever. Um, and that's wrong. That's, that's very, very true. Wrong. Very true. Thank you. Um, I actually was, uh, <clears throat> you know, you know, I know you, you alluded about colors and uh, I'm not going to ask you a question about color, but again, I'm going to ask you a question about the effect of color in deciding the winning dog uh, or uh, they actually, they, you know, when you look at a dog, when you actually look at the silhouette of the dog, that's your starting point of judging the dog. Mm -hmm. And a dog which is actually got color in it, uh, when I say color, uh, when I say uh, uh, a solid dog, which is not colored, and versus a, a, a dog which has got a flashy dog, which has got white, a white dog definitely looks, you know, the, the size of the bones uh, or the way the dog is, you know, you, you wouldn't, you, the dog actually does not look um it actually does not look as uh, bony as a dog which has got less bones let's say I, i'm just going to throw that out there i my question here for you is now with the bones being the tools uh that the muscles of the dog work on there's a wide deviation in style based on um bone density or the size of the bones some dogs are overdone and some dogs are not overdone when would you actually as a judge um you know, penalize the dog for being overdone in terms of bones. In terms of? In terms of the bone size. Bone size, okay. So this, okay, so we're not really talking about color here. Right, we're not talking I about think color what you, what, Yeah, so what, you, what you're basically saying is color can give an illusion of either less or no Correct. bone. Correct. Um, so the, the boxer is a moderate dog. And there should be no exaggerations. So I think that as soon as there is too much of something, you are moving to overdone. So, um, you know, as you were saying, short is good, shorter is better. And I understand you weren't making the point from your point of view, but it's just something that that is a perception. Um, as soon as you start going down that road, then you are again you're, you're changing the breed into something else i would be probably as critical on an overdone boxer as i would on an underdone boxer because if i have a boxer in front of me that has no wrinkles on its forehead it looks like its muzzles being ironed um, and it's very light in structure um, and doesn't have the power that the standard asks for, that to me is as bad as a boxer that comes in looking like it is in the wrong breed and should maybe be coming in as a bull mastiff. Or, and I mean no disrespect to, to bull mastiffs, but a boxer is not a bull mastiff. So um, both sides of the, of the um, scale are wrong. Um, and I do believe that judges need to put up a big stop sign when they see a, a trend in a breed. Um, and that's why I also say as a judge, you need to know what's prevalent in the breed around the world because yeah. things creep in. And if you don't know that um, the breed is becoming too tall, for example, and you go into a ring and there's a whole bunch of tall boxes and one that looks really small, your eye would say to you that small one's not right, that, that's way undersized, when in actual fact that's the correct dog and the oversized ones are the ones that are not correct. So you need to know where the breed is going, what's prevalent, um, and I, I don't believe that overtype and undertype should be rewarded. Um, I think if I was in the ring and all I had was an underdone boxer and an overdone boxer, I probably would sway to the overdone because that, although it's too much, is still a bit more businesslike than a very light 
uh, individual who would never be able to to do what boxers should be able to do and and you know the, the the way they were used in in the war or you know as as police dogs or whatever you're not going to get that from a, a you know a little tiny little true, thin true. boned Perfect. thing yeah. thank you so much um now my next few questions are for you uh, are going to be uh, from your view as an ambassador for the breed um, I know that you share your knowledge through seminars, through articles that you, and I'm sure you mentor breeders as well. So I'm going to actually, I, I know that you're going to, you are a mentor now um, to a lot of people watching this. Now, as a mentor, uh, what would be your piece of advice to a novice judge uh, to become popular and be a sought out judge? There's popular and there's popular. Um, and it depends in whose eyes you are a popular judge. I think, as I mentioned before, that as a judge, your only um, allegiance and your only responsibility and loyalty is to the breed. So if you have researched and you've learned and you know the standard backwards and you've done your homework and you've looked at as many different styles as you can and uh, find somebody who, like I did right at the beginning, I would find photos and critique them and send them on to my mentor and say, have I, you know, am I seeing this right? Um, only once you've done all of that, would you become a popular judge with the exhibitors because I don't mind going in under a judge who makes an honest mistake or likes a style different to what I'm presenting to them. So while I believe style shouldn't really be part of your judging decision, it is. We're all human and we are subjective. Um, but I do have a problem going under a judge that has either doesn't know boxes very well and actually again picks the generic dog um, and and unfortunately there's judges out there that have a different agenda um, and and I, I don't judge to make friends um, and I think if you're starting out as a as a newbie judge then you've got to be very clear in your mind why you're doing it why do you want to become a judge if you want to become a judge to be invited around the world to go and see all sorts of countries that you don't have to pay for, um, that to me is the wrong the wrong reason. Um, and I think those judges possibly, and I'm not, and again, I'm showing no disrespect to any judge, but uh, it's hypothetical. Those kind of judges would be popular with your, uh, with the people they shouldn't be popular with. So you're possibly your top winners that, um, somehow have an allegiance to you or you have an allegiance to them and they know that, you know, they, they it's a sure thing that they're going to get the ticket or the whatever it is that's being awarded. Um, so you've got to make sure that you're in it for the right reasons and the right reason is only to find the boxer in or boxers in that ring that are as close to the standard as you understand it and as you have learnt in, in an in-depth way. Um, I don't think any judge can read a book, look at a photograph and walk into a ring and think I know the breed. You have to have your hands on live dogs. Um, you have to go and speak to people. You can't just go, for example, to um, get one judge's opinion. You need, because as I say, we're all subjective. So you need to, to find mentors in more than one breeder, more than one judge, uh, because you want a rounded view. Uh, you know, you don't want to go to a judge who head is everything and, um, and that's all you learn about. And then you go into a ring and you're faced with um, boxes with heads that, that aren't quite like what your mentor told you and, you and there you're stuck because you don't know anything else. So I just think it's honesty, uh, asking loads of questions, become a pest. Um, and 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 love love boxes. You you have to love them. You've, there's nothing worse than a, for an exhibitor to go into a ring and feel like they're taking up the judge's time. Mm. 
Mm. Um, you, you know, you, you, it's horrible to stand there and have a judge looking at you or the class with as if they've just had a lemon in their mouth. I mean, there's nothing worse. It's an absolute joy to show under a judge who is loving being in the center of the ring, who is smiling at the at the puppies uh, as they gamble around the ring and are naughty and you know and and another thing that I'm really really um, strict about is everybody that brings their dog into that ring under you has paid the exact same fee. They've all hopefully bathed their dogs. They've they've fed their dogs the best that they can. They are dressed the best that they are able to. And they all deserve your your same attention from the very first dog that you look at to the very last dog in the very last class. You cannot, um, let's say, a very obvious pet comes in and you can't then just cast your eye over it and vaguely move them and dismiss them and then a really good one comes in and you spend a load of time looking at that dog because that's disrespectful to, to the exhibitor who was in previously and who loves their dog. Um, and, and this is the thing, these it, people love their dogs and, and you need to give them all the same amount of attention you need to. If you, you know, go from the head and, and put your hand down the back and whatever it is you're doing, doing it to every single dog. What you do to the first dog, you do to the very last dog. And that's something I think that is really important. And that kind of judging will make you popular with exhibitors because they feel like they got a look. That judge looked at my dog. And again, that's going <clears> to, I'm sorry, you, you're doing the talking and I'm actually, you know, checking my throat. Um, and uh, <clears throat> sorry, I, I, again, valid, valid point. And again, my next question to you, and again, and I don't have too many questions left, so, um, you know, I know I could actually keep on talking for the next few hours with you, Monique. You're very, very interesting. Uh, but I'm actually going to actually value your time. I'm going to ask you the last few questions here. Um, now, as you mentioned a few things about breeders, what they should be doing, about judges, what they should be doing. Uh, and my my other segment that I know that you're, you're actually involved in administrative capacity with the club as well. Now, what do you see as the responsibilities of the clubs in charting the path ahead for the breed? I'm currently not involved with any any clubs, um, but I have been in the past. Um, I think that clubs have a very important role to play um, because it's the club that that forms a central uh, um, contact point. So now you as a breeder, you've bred a litter, you've sold a puppy to a young family that's really keen to either breed or show. Um, you join them to the club that you are a member of. That club should then nurture that person, involve them. Um, the Western Province Boxer Club, which is a club I'm a member of, have a fantastic magazine that they put out um, that's full of all sorts of things that are great interest to um, learner judges, to um, your, even your pet people. Um, and it's got interesting articles on health and things like that. And I think that the clubs need to have a, a two-way conversation with the members of the club and organize things to get people together. Um, your, your new people, your experienced breeders have events where you can bring those people together so that these new people have somebody in a very relaxed atmosphere to chat to and and get information from the worst thing you can do is pitch up at a show as somebody's about to step in the ring and you want to discuss getting a puppy from them or discuss you know that particular job because generally the handlers go into the zone um, and and you, you need to encourage young people and new people. You don't want to to be off-putting, but sometimes, you know, if you're so focused, you, you may come across that way. Um, so the clubs are really important to, to almost bridge the gap and to provide knowledge and to provide information and to nurture 
the, the new people. Obviously, the breeder has a responsibility to do that as well. You shouldn't just sell your puppy and as they drive out the gate, you're like, phew, that one's gone. Um, you know, the, the, the breeders need to involve their people as well. Um, and also when these people get to shows, with, with Western Province Boxer Club, we have a gazebo set up at, at the shows, whether it's an all breeds or, or an, a specialty show. And the committee members wear um, specific club shirts so that they're easily recognizable. And they're there to help people and to, you know, if somebody's not sure how to handle, they can give them a short lesson on the outside. Or I know of some people who will say to these newcomers, do you want me to show your dog for the first time? You know, and take the dog in there and let them see how it, how it works and just explain everything to them. Um, and that, I think, is where clubs come in because you can't expect the exhibitors to, to have the time at a busy show to do that. And, and some exhibitors may be exhibiting more than one breed or in that particular, maybe even in more than one group um, or even in that breed more than one dog, um, you know. So I think it's really important that... I think it's it, everybody has a part to play. Um, we need to be inclusive. We can't be exclusive. We need to, everybody needs to encourage youngsters um, and and no, no question is stupid. And no matter how long you've been in the game, don't be arrogant and think you can learn nothing from a, a person that's not been in the game as long as you because you if we can all learn. We don't know everything. And often a newer uh, person in, in the sport might have a, a view of something that you've never thought of, or you may be a bit jaded in how you view something. And there's nothing nicer than meeting up with an enthusiastic person who puts a whole new new perspective on it. Um, just as a, as a complete aside, I traveled to... Um, uh, Rome years and years ago and I went to see the Sistine Chapel and I went I met up with an artist which I didn't meet up with them on purpose we just happened to to um, be on the same tour and what I learned from looking at the Sistine Chapel and the paintings and all of that from listening to an artist was way more than if I had walked in there and just looked at it myself I love art um, I collect art. I have dabbled a bit myself in art. But still, to be with somebody and get their eye on it and their impression, um, and and I could contribute and say things to that artist and it was, oh, yeah, yeah, I didn't see that or whatever. So I think there's no place for arrogance. And, um, and, and again, no question is stupid. And that's something that... I believe in, in all walks of life. I believe it in my business, uh, with boxes, with anything. Um, and the worst thing you can do is to put down somebody who might be asking a question that you may think is stupid. To them, it's not a stupid question. All right. Thank you so much. That brings us to my last question. <clears throat> uh, and again, since you've been really kind and uh, open and nice, I'm going to actually give you an easy one. <clears throat> so, Monique, um, if you went back in time, <clears throat> uh, in the time machine of your choice, you know, maybe it's a DeLorean, uh, maybe maybe <laughs> it's it's a Doctor uh, a Doctor Who. I don't know which which one it is. You can choose the machine you want. Uh, but if you went back in time, and you had the opportunity uh, that allowed you to change one thing about the breed, what would that be? For me, that's that's easy. One of the things that the breed has lost and is losing at an alarming rate are excellent fronts. So if I could go back to a time where the fronts were uniformly excellent, where layback of shoulder was there, where fore chest was there, where the correct length of upper arm, good return of upper arm, I would want to go back to that time and shake everybody and say, look at this and don't lose it. Um, it's one of the things, and once you've lost it, the further down the line you go with having lost something, you cannot get it back because there's nothing left for you to use to get it back. 
Uh, and it goes again to what I was saying about, about newcomers. If they are going into the ring and they're seeing what they're seeing and it's not correct, they perceive that as correct and that's where they're going to aim for. But also the human eye gets used to things very easily and very quickly. And it's not a, it wasn't something that happened overnight. It was a slow progression. But if you start comparing um, some of the wind photos that you see today with wind photos of 15 years ago, there's a huge difference. And sometimes it's for the better, but as far as front angulation goes, it's, in my opinion, it's for the worst. It's now very difficult to find in, a, in an entry consistently good fronts. Um, I, I, that's one of my important things. You know, as I mentioned earlier, there's judges that have very specific things that are really important to them. For me, it's good front angulation. It has to be balanced to the rear angulation, obviously. But we are losing fronts. Um, and another thing that I would also like to raise a red flag a few years ago are bites. Um, boxer bites are deteriorating. They they are becoming narrow the they're becoming misaligned you know i've opened mouths of champions before and was horrified what i was looking at and yes a boxer is more than just its bite uh, a box is more than just its four-quarter angulation but where do you draw the line when you start um accepting or forgiving certain things where do you stop because today it's the bite and tomorrow it's mm, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll forgive that extra wrinkle on the head. And, you know, the next thing you know, our boxes are no longer square. They're now long. Um, you know, and, and we've just, we've, we've, we're losing our breed. And um, so, yeah, if I could go back, I would no clue what machine I would use. But I, I want to go back to the time where the fronts were excellent. And as I say, shake everybody about and say, please don't lose this because, it's so hard to get it back. Wonderful. I, I, I think that's uh, that's hitting the nail in the head. Um, Monica, I want to actually thank you. Um, I want to thank you for having agreed to share details of your journey uh, with Indian Boxer Ring. Um, you know, it's, um, it's sessions like this, which actually are not only primers for, um, primers for, you know, for, you know, for us to look at standard, interpret standard, but it's also, your knowledge and perspectives, which actually uh, shine, you know, uh, which which shine light in the direction that we should be looking at uh, the breed. Um, now you you have, uh, you know, you this you demonstrated passion, you demonstrated uh, openness, and uh, you you actually been a wonderful spokesperson for the breed. And um, in total, you are a wonderful ambassador for the breed, and it's a pleasure hosting you today. And if I, if ever I get a chance, um, and if you're going to be judging, I you have my entry. I'm going to show under you for sure. Uh, do you have any final thoughts before we conclude the interview? Uh, just huge thank you to you and your team for allowing me to uh, to, to have this opportunity. Um, honestly, I can talk about boxes for hours. So it's just as well that we had a time limit because I could do this all day. Um, for me, it's a huge honor when I see some of the people that you have interviewed and the people that I know you are going to interview. I'm very humble um, that you've included me in that in that group of people. Um, you know, when when you're in South Africa, it's you, you kind of quite far removed from from things. Um, but it's 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 great to be able to share with with people um, in this country. Uh, I know there are some people in South Africa that are online, but you know all over the place. And I I just I, I love boxes. They 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 I'm so passionate about them. And I'm you know it's it's they're the, just the most amazing breed. And the more we can all learn about them and 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 come together and work with each other and have a have a vision together that we are we're all on the same side and we're all trying to produce a dog that is is as per the standard um, and there's no there's no room for for you know petty arguments or um, you know saying nasty things about people's opinions and things like that it's just 
no, it's, yeah, thank you. I, I must say no more, otherwise I will carry on all day. Um, but it's it's been an absolute pleasure, and thank you so much. I've loved every minute of it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Monique. And uh, for those viewers that are tuning in, this interview is going to be available uh, on YouTube. I'll be actually, um, I'll be uploading that interview on YouTube. So, uh, the, and again, if you want to look at all the past interviews that I've had the opportunity to host, uh, those interviews are also available on YouTube. Uh, all you've got to do is search for Indian Boxer Ring, and um, you can actually, all that information is available for you to use, uh, to actually view and to share as you as you. Uh, thank you one, once more, uh, Monique, for sharing your time. And uh, for those viewers, have yourself a wonderful day and uh, stay safe. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Isha. It's been lovely.